All right, everyone, it's uh, 934. We'll uh, get started once again. Governor, have your seats. Um, the clarification uh, that I wanted to make from earlier, we spoke a little bit about our meeting with the Supreme Court tomorrow, uh, and there was a misunderstanding as to whether it would be an executive session. Um, there's gonna be a component of the meeting in executive session, the entire meeting, uh, will not be an executive session. There will be a public portion. Um, most of the meeting will be public, um, but there will be a discussion in executive session. So I just wanted to make that clear for uh, anyone who may have misunderstood my comments earlier. All right, with that, uh, our next discussion item is the annual discussion with the deans of the law schools. We have Dean... Uh, Annette Clark, Mario Barnes, and uh, Jacob Rooksby, I believe, are all three of you uh, with us? Hard for me to see on our screen. This is Jacob, I'm here. Thank Annette, you, I'm Dean here. Rooksby, Dean Clark, and uh, Dean Barnes. I'm here as well. Wonderful, great. Well, welcome. Uh, too bad that you couldn't join us here in Southwest Washington personally. It's a beautiful part of our state and we would have welcomed you with open arms, but this is just as good. Every year uh, we take time out to meet with uh, the deans of the three law schools and, and get updates. Um, we didn't, it was a bit of a remiss on uh, my part and, and executive director Nevitt's part. We were intending to send out an email with some discussion um, topics. Um, but we found ourselves uh, behind the ball and didn't do that. But hopefully um, uh, we'll have a, a good conversation, governors, with uh, questions that you might have. We had a um, listening tour uh, that I participated in along with Executive Director Nevitt over the course of the summer. And I have some um, comments and some questions that uh, arose during those uh, discussions. So that'll, that'll be part of this discussion as well. But um, I will turn it over to uh, the deans for their presentation. And then, like I said, hopefully we'll have a good discussion about things that are uh, related to the law schools and, and our graduating students. And I don't know which Dean Clark or Dean uh, Rooksby or Dean Barnes is, uh, I don't know which one to, to um, go to first. <laughs> well, you can choose or we can just start. All right, Dean Clark, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Sure, um, I'll keep this short. I think from, from our standpoint, all three deans, um, the value of this is always in the dialogue as opposed to our talking heads. But um, just to give a quick update, um, this last year was a banner year for legal education in terms of the admissions market. Um, and it's so nice to be able to report that because this is my ninth year as Dean at Seattle U Law and I, I have never been able to say that before. Um, so applications to law schools across the country were up around 25% um, and the Pacific Northwest was really leading the way. We had the greatest increase in percentage applications from all of the regions across the country. Um, so I think that was that was good news for all of us. It allowed the law schools to be more selective um, in terms of their entering classes. I'll give you a quick sketch of our entering class. Uh, we have 231 entering JD students. 62% of them are women. 35% uh, are students of color. 21% uh, identify as LGBTQ. Um, 30% are first generation to college, uh, let alone law school. 4% um, are veterans. Um, and this is the year that we transitioned our part-time program from a traditional evening program to what is now a hybrid online and then immersive uh, three weekends each semester. And we had a 100% increase in applications to that part-time program with the switch in format. Um, so we've launched the new Flex JD um, this fall, just met with some of those students yesterday. So far, it seems to be going well. Um, so, a, you know, just a great uh, 1L class and so nice to be back in person. That's probably the biggest news is that we've reopened Sullivan Hall. 
uh, classes started in person. We have a few students who are taking courses completely online, but overall faculty, staff, and students are back. Uh, we're a fully vaccinated university. The rate of vaccination in the law school is at about 97% fully vaccinated. So um, it, it, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to, to see students, to hear their laughter, to hear their conversation, um, and to be engaged with them. Um, other big news from Seattle University, um, we start our inaugural festivities today for our new president, Eduardo Peñal there. Um, those of you who haven't had the chance to meet Eduardo, I hope you do soon. Um, he's one of us. Uh, he was most recently the Dean at Cornell Law. Um, and so he comes to his presidency with incredible knowledge about legal education, uh, the value that we bring and the importance of lawyers. Um, so I would recommend him as someone to speak before the Board of Governors if you have that opportunity. Uh, his inauguration is tomorrow. We kick off with an inaugural mass this afternoon. Um, I also have uh, uh, made the announcement that this is my final year as Dean at Seattle U Law. Um, nine years in this most recent stretch and one year as interim Dean, that's 10. Um, that seems like the right number to, to sail into the sunset, although I will remain on the faculty at Seattle U. Um, so we are engaged in a dean search. Um, the committee's been appointed and that national search um, will begin in the month of October. Um, so I would imagine by um, February or so, uh, we'll know who the new dean is and that person will start on July 1st, 2022. Um, gosh, so many other things. The final thing I'll say is that three law schools have been collaborating. Um, co-leading, if you will, a race and uh, the criminal justice system task force in the state of Washington, uh, led by my faculty member, Professor Bob Chang, a total collaborative effort. Um, they're about to issue their report. It's a follow-up on a report that was done 10 years ago, um, and that task force will be presenting to the Washington Supreme Court next Wednesday. Um, I understand there are already over 250 people registered for the virtual presentation. Um, hope some of you will be able to join us. Um, it's not only a report of their findings, but also recommendations for reform of our criminal justice system in the state of Washington. Um, I'll stop there and give my colleagues a chance to speak. Thank you, Dean Clark. Dean Barnes. Uh, thank you, and uh, once again, uh, thank you to the Board of Governors for welcoming us for this opportunity to share our news. Um, unlike the other two schools, which have been in session for almost um, five weeks, we actually did orientation the last two days, and we don't start until uh, Monday, but uh, we too um, are back in session uh, in person, subject to a huge stack of COVID um, protocols that um, make this uh, you know, a, a bit more difficult than we had hoped when we planned to come back, but are absolutely necessary to protect the health and safety of our faculty, students, and staff. Um, like Annette, we have just welcomed an incredible class, both in terms of its academic credentials. It's actually, she, she mentioned one part of the story, which is that the numbers are way up in terms of applications to law school. Um, the other part of the story is students uh, with very high um, test scores was actually up in this cycle as well. So there were um, in terms of academic uh, credentials, um, uh, the pool was excellent, and we were able to admit uh, 176 students who have the best credentials of any class, really, that we've admitted in a, um, a decade. And most importantly for us, because this has been a goal um, that we have constantly strived for, it is the greatest diversity, really, um, in recent history at the University of Washington, which is 44% um, of the class identifies as uh, underrepresented minority. We've never had anything really higher than the um, high 30s, and that was last year's class, and that was already a 12-point improvement. Um, like many law school classes, the class is predominantly women with 59% um, identifying um, as female, um, and uh, as is the tradition uh, with us as a public school, the greatest portion, or 60% of our students, um, uh, come from within the state um, of Washington. And so um, we are very excited to welcome not only our, our, our students back, but our faculty and our staff. Um, and I think the major change for us that, we, that COVID initiated, but will be with us 
um, and to our near future is almost all of our staff is working on a hybrid or flex schedule, um, meaning that uh, almost all of the staff is working a number of days um, from home. And prior to COVID, almost none of the staff did. And my understanding is the same is true um, uh, in the profession, having had a recent lunch with uh, partners and in in-house counsel, that it, it seems to be that what we are experiencing here is, is what is being experienced um, everywhere in terms of having a now greater appreciation for hybrid and flex work. Um, on our agenda this year are two large items. We completed over the summer um, uh, our sustainable academic business plan, um, uh, which is essentially a, a blueprint for um, the law school undertaking planning um, toward a new vision of legal education um, at the University of Washington uh, for the next um, five years. And we also completed our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan, which sets out five goals uh, for continuing to improve the diversity of the faculty, staff, and student body. And so both of those will now uh, be central parts of the uh, undertaking for this year. So I will stop there to give Jacob the floor, and I'm excited to welcome questions from the Board of Governors. Thank you, Dean Barnes. Uh, let's go to Dean Rixby, and then we'll open it up to questions and uh, and uh, a discussion. Governor Williams Ruth, did you want to ask a question of Dean after? Okay. Uh, so, Dean, Dean Rixby, welcome. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Good to see familiar faces, even if on a Zoom screen. I will try to be brief in my comments. First, I want to congratulate my colleague Annette on 10 magnificent years at the helm. Uh, she is a true leader of our field and I know will be uh, greatly missed in her role, although not missed at the university. And it's been a pleasure to get to work with Annette and to collaborate. Um, the three of us have worked at other schools and other states. And I would just offer that I, I don't think that you will see the same level of collaboration um, across the United States with other law schools in those states. Um, so, and that's in, in large measure, I think, a testament to, to Annette's leadership because uh, when Mario and I started, she was the senior dean, if you will, of the state's law schools. So uh, will be a loss for sure for us as well. Uh, this is gonna sound like a broken record. So you have heard um, from my colleagues about the great growth in uh, the admissions and the great growth in diversity and our student bodies, and the story is the same at Gonzaga, I am happy to report. So we admitted and enrolled 192 students, our largest class since 2007, um, our most academically qualified class ever, and tied for our most diverse uh, class ever at 27%. So we are very happy with uh, where things are, uh, but of course are also always trying to look into the crystal ball to see where things are going to go. Um, I don't believe that this past year is going to be indicative of trends for the next five years. I think we'll see some stabilization. Um, and so that is certainly informing our planning in terms of uh, how we are operating our law school. We were uh, in person last year. And so we were not all online last year. We were the, I think the only law school in the state that had that format. Um, we did offer hybrid classes last year, but we had students in the building. That said, it was not the same. There were students coming in and then leaving. Um, you know, the events were all online. Guest speakers were all online. This year, we have a 100% back to campus plan that was announced by our university president for all schools on campus. And so we have uh, a lot of hustle and bustle now in the building. And it is, it is really welcome to see, as, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, it is how law school, I think, should be. Um, we are permitting staff to work remotely one day a week, um, but predominantly we are a workforce that is, is in person on campus. And um, so far, so good. Um, there have been some hiccups as there are in COVID, our never ending uh, pandemic. But I do think we're, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing reasons for hope on the horizon, of course. And uh, like the other schools, we have a vaccine mandate uh, and with over 95% compliance from, from everyone on campus. Look forward to your questions and, and the discussion. Thank you, Dean Rixby. And I, on two, wish to thank Dean Clark for her 10 years of service as Dean. Um, 
I've enjoyed hearing from you, uh, Dean Clark, over the last three or four years that you've come to speak to the WSBA, and then occasionally we get to see, talk over the phone. And uh, I've always appreciated your insight and 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 willingness to to take my phone calls and and talk with me when needed. So I appreciate that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a um, the opportunity to MC the 50 year member celebration at T-Mobile Park. And uh, I've done this for the last two or three years. We, we had to skip 2020, but 2018 and 2019. And uh, we would take a photo at, at, at that occasion. And uh, in 18 and 19, it was uh, filled with um, older gentlemen. Um, and uh, when we post on, on the internet, it was not unnoticed that there were no women. Um, and just just this last year, um, we had the the um, great fortune to have uh, former Justice uh, Faith Ireland and another uh, woman practitioner to join that uh, that group. Uh, two women out of a total, I think, of around sixty um, people who were celebrating their fifty years. I also talked with um, the recipient of the Apex Awards last year, uh, Jean Shaw, a local attorney here, who graduated from law school in Gonzaga in 1975, I believe. And uh, she was telling me just the other day that uh, out of the entire law school, about 100, 100 folks, there were five women who graduated. Um, and it's, it's, it's exciting. And I told her, I said, well, that, you know, 50 years from now, it's going to look a lot different. We've got 62% women at, at Seattle University and 59% at, uh, at uh, University of Washington. Those are great numbers. And the 44% underrepresented minorities is extraordinary. So we're, we're headed in the right direction. Um, when we did the listening tour this last uh, summer, um, there was some discussion about whether the enrollment figures were up or down. People were curious about that. And then uh, they were also curious about commitment to rural practice. And I'm going to, I'm going to um, circle back on this. I'll, I'll recognize Governor Williams Ruth, but uh, one of the discussion items that I'd like to look at, uh, or at least talk about today is you know, what, what can the law schools or what are the law schools doing to ensure that uh, rural practices are um, being recognized and, and, and attorneys who are graduating from our law schools perhaps are encouraged to go into the rural areas and, and represent people uh, in those legal, what we've been calling legal deserts, one of the things that uh, I'd be interested in. But um, Governor Williams Ruth, you were first. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate a moment of personal privilege uh, because as this board knows, I give most credit to who I am as an adult and as an attorney and as a governor to my time at Seattle University. And last spring, uh, Seattle University saw the retirement of Dean Donna Deming, and on the day of her retirement party since we were here, I read a nice tribute to her. Well. It's 10 years that Dean Clark has been Dean, but it's been 22 years since she was my civil procedure professor and the associate Dean, I believe of academic affairs. And it's been 22 years of professorship, mentorship and friendship. And in a school that had more students than they had now back in 1999, but only 10 in all three years were openly LGBTQ students, and more have since come out after graduation. I appreciate everything that she has done as a professor and to support the transition from University of Puget Sound School of Law to Seattle University School of Law. I was there in that tier years where it was the first years of Seattle University at Sullivan Hall. In fact, I like to claim that I was the first person to graduate as doing school in two and a half years since I started the entire program in June of 1999. But really, and Dean Clark knows that I give my life to the work that she's done because as not only a JD, most people know she's also an MD. And she spotted in me severe depression after the first semester of class where she took me aside and said, you're not the same happy guy that started in August. Is everything okay? 
and it wasn't. Law school is hard. Being an island of, and, and I didn't even realize as a young 22 year old, what it meant to be in a room where there were only two other gay people and surprise, we didn't like each other. It's not like, hey, you're gay. We're all gonna be instant friends. And realizing how hard that was in addition to the rigors of academia. And because of her, I sought help. I sought treatment and I'm here. And the work that Seattle University does in training lawyers and training people to be engaged in whatever it is that lights your fire is really what I think of as the testament of Annette Clark as a professor and as the dean. So I don't know that you're going to come back. And I know you have another year, but I just want to make sure publicly you truly understand what the last 22 years has meant to me as a person, as a member of the LGBT community, and as an attorney. And I look forward to what's coming next in your world and where Seattle University will go. And I will continue as a proud alum to be involved and to support what we started back in 1999. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Williams Ruth. Another powerful reminder of uh, what not only professors, but also teachers in our lives um, have on students. So thank you for sharing that, Governor Williams Ruth. Thank you, Brent. I, I didn't plan on crying in front of the Board of Governors today, but that did it. Thank you. Governor Stevens. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, and uh, Dean Clark, just so you know, I am a University of Puget Sound graduate, technically a Saddle U graduate, and very proud of it. Uh, I want my colleagues to know that um, as a member of the entering class, uh, entering in 1976 out in South Tacoma Way, I was the only African American in that class, period. And you could count the people, the people of color in that entire class on one hand, period. Um, what's past is prologue. So here's my questions to, to all of you. One, I would hope you would discuss what you attribute to the uptick in uh, law, law student applications. Um, because actually I would have thought you know, I would have guessed with COVID, et cetera, et cetera, the opposite would, would have been the case. I would have made a bet on that and lost and glad to have lost. That's the first question. The second one, and by the way, for all of the deans, um, you put, um, at, at least if not to rest, you put information on the table as an advocate for affirmative action and diversity that you can have both and have quality students across the board. There's usually this unstated deal that if you actually get the kind of results you have, the quality of the students go down. You're proving that not to be the case. And so I'd also like to know what do you attribute at your three law schools to, um, I mean, just incredible information regarding the number of women uh, uh, BIPOC people of color and, um, and LGBTQ at your schools. So those are my two questions. You know, one, what do you attribute across the board to this uptick? And, and then what do you attribute to what the three of you have done to actually increase the uh, demographic profiles at your, at your schools? Thank you, Governor Stevens. Who, who would like to start? I'll take uh, uh, the first part of it and, and, and say, I don't know that we actually ever know in terms of trends at law schools what produces these up. We, we, we had one a few years ago that they called the Trump bump because it seemed to come um, after the election and it, people thought it was the sort of extreme politics that produced this moment of people realizing that law was more central than ever to um, uh, keeping the sort of government um, uh, you know, bipartisan. But my, my sense is anytime you have large societal transition events, 
like COVID, ones that affect employment, that people um, make decisions uh, about priority, prioritizing education. And I do think what this data is telling us is that law remains a very attractive profession uh, for folks who are thinking about ways in which to do two things, enhance their own lives professionally and to be an agent for helping others. And my sense is any events that um, you know, speak to um, both the opportunity to improve oneself and to help others and to remind us that law is a noble profession, um, uh, support the sort of increase in numbers. But I don't know that we ever know it because we never see a sustained trend, right? It's always, it has always been one to, years, one to two years as a one-off. And so with, the, with regard to the question on how we are creating the increased diversity at University of Washington, I'll, I'll say a couple things. First of all, I didn't report our, LG, our, our LGBTQ numbers, which are 26% of this class this year, but there's only two things that um, explain our, um, our, our change in our numbers. One is prioritizing um, the recruitment um, of students of color, first-generation students, um, uh, veterans, LGBTQ. The other thing, and this is money, um, it has always been known that the, the lead barrier to, to law school for many has been the, the financial burden and that for students of color who are um, often disproportionately less wealthy to begin with, the, the, the concept of taking on the burden of huge amounts of loans is just daunting. So um, in the last two years, um, we have raised more money for diversity scholarships um, than, we have, uh, than we had done in the, the recent several years before that. And that money directly attributed to us being able to recruit, and I want to use uh, Governor Stevens' words, a class that was both diverse um, and academically excellent. And I completely agree that those things are not mutually exclusive. But um, as, as is the case, um, it is rare that you get a large enough gift to sustain this year over year. And what I have gotten was pledges of people to support diversity scholarships, or one we call the Justice Scholarship, for a two-year period. And now I'm back um, and in the same position of needing to raise that money over and over again, um, if I wanna offer a new set of students the same opportunity, because I think most schools do the same. We don't offer students one year of funding. If I make you a scholarship offer, it's for three years. Um, and so I'm costing out you know, three years of a substantial reduction um, uh, on your fees, but, and that's the way it should be, but it, it takes a lot um, of support. And I will say the Central University um, has also uh, more recently been supporting our efforts to increase diversity. But the, the bottom line for me, it's prioritization um, and having um, philanthropy and funding to support that choice. Thank you, Dean Barnes. Dean Clark or Dean Rixby, do you have any thoughts on that? A similar answer, I think, to the first question. There is continued, there continues to be lots of social unrest and um, the murder of George Floyd climate change, um, our understanding societally of inequality, um, I think has made uh, pursuing a legal education quite attractive for a new generation of students. Um, they see the law as a vehicle for change, which it is. And we are seeing um, more students passionate about making an impact in the world. And they have a real sense of why they want to be in law school, uh, perhaps even more than students of a generation ago. Um, at Gonzaga, we have made some curricular changes in terms of profiling our work in civil and human rights through our Center for Civil and Human Rights. Um, we were one of the first law schools in the country to launch an LGBTQ rights clinic. And um, we also recently launched an immigration law clinic in partnership with Catholic Charities of Eastern Washington. These things are noticed by applicants and they draw students um, to our school from diverse backgrounds. Whether they go on to participate in these clinics or not, the messaging value of having them is, is quite strong. And um, we have been much more intentional, like Dean Barnes, in how we allocate resources. So we have dedicated for the first time resources for uh, diverse students to attend our law school, uh, paying no tuition. And diversity is broadly defined, um, but we have named these scholarships after Carl Maxey, a graduate of ours, uh, first African-American lawyer in Eastern Washington, very prominent career. Um, so we're seeing these kinds of changes uh, resonate with our, with our applicant pool. Thank you, Dean Rixby. Dean Clark? 
agree with everything that, that both Dean Barnes and Dean Rooksby have said, particularly the importance of scholarship money. Um, and whether that's year to year as Dean Barnes is using or endowments, which is what we really prefer. Um, if we can bring in um, investors in our institution who are able to make sizable gifts that we can then spin off interest income, that's what allows us to um, have those scholarships over time in perpetuity. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that in addition to the work that we all do, um, to bring in these amazingly talented, diverse students is the environments we create. Um, and, and we know the importance um, of not just diversity, but inclusion. And so we've been doing a lot of work with regard to um, creating an anti-racist law school. That's work that's happening across the country. We've adopted a new learning outcome related to anti-racism and are now working through our entire curriculum, figuring out what does it mean when one of our only seven um, learning outcomes for all of our students is about anti-racism, um, working on bias incident response plans, uh, workshops with faculty in terms of how to deal with uh, difficult issues in class, difficult conversations about race and racism, race equity, um, how to deal with microaggressions, how, how to respond and handle them. So, um, and it's not just about race too, that's certainly true with our LBGTQ students. Um, so a reminder that we're also all doing work that, that helps our students feel a sense of belonging. And when we go out and try to bring in our next class, you can bet that that reputation for what kind of culture do we have um, matters to incoming students. And they ask those questions and they ask it of current students. Um, so we are held accountable in that regard. Thank you, Dean Clark. I have uh, Governor-elect Adewale followed by Governor Clark. Thank you, President. Um, can I bring this down a little so Governor Egerton could hear me? Is that okay? <laughs> Nobody, no. Okay, I'll put it on. Um, <laughs> I want to say a big thank you to Dean Rooksby uh, for your leadership um, uh, in Eastern Washington. About a year ago, the Sokane County Bar Association organized the systemic racism CLE. And coming out of that CLE, the challenge was given to the bar and the bench in Eastern Washington to do more for racial justice. And you stood up, you supported the minority businesses in Spokane, you mobilized your team, your faculties, and you actually chaired the meeting with minority businesses in Spokane. And that work has helped us to reach out to communities that were neglected and abandoned and businesses that would lift people out of poverty. And that work is ongoing and I'm proud to say Gonzaga is at the cutting edge of how to reach out to communities. And you were there, you, you didn't take a back seat. So Dean Rigsby, I want to say a big thank you to you. That is why we have a high number of donations to the CalMax Diversity Scholarship this year. And that's why the community themselves are taking leadership in, in raising the next cadre of lawyers in Eastern Washington from their community, which leads me to the school support for the small town and rural communities uh, initiative. Thanks to Lori Powers and others, I want Gonzaga Law to continue to support this program and to continue to help us craft um, any program that will help us be able to recruit and retain. When Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho and Montana were facing challenges with regards to medical professionals staying back in our community, both UW and WSU Medical School did set up a program that addressed this issue and is specifically targeted at retaining medical professionals 
in rural communities in this area. That is the same type of initiative and the state government provided funding for that purpose. That is what we're gonna to need to be able to change the dynamics where lawyers come from those communities, from those rural communities, because at, as at this present time, no parents in high school or anything will be able to afford to send their kids to the law school because of the funding and the, the, the economic challenge attendant to the debt for portfolio. But if the state government really want to help us address this issue, they can provide funding for this. And I hope Gonzaga will be able to help us continue to lead this charge because we are emerging a lot of experience attorney in small and rural towns in Central and Eastern Washington. And we need to move this go forward. This was the focus of the meeting that the president and the director of the bar associations had. This, it contains of almost 90, 90 minutes of conversation was all about this issue, that the, the, this challenge. So I hope we are able to address this problem. And for Dean Burns, I want to acknowledge your support for the technology for access to justice. UW has been able to help us with regards to, you know, the digital divide, the ability of the poor to be able to access justice using technology is crucial because what one thing that has been clear from this pandemic year is the fact that your ability to be able to come to court is dependent on whether you can use technology or you have access to it or you have Wi-Fi or you don't have Wi-Fi. So, you know, you don't, I hope we continue with the leadership of Terry Price and others at UW Law School to continue to help us with the tech justice plan. The tech justice plan is meant to enable the poor that do not have access like each and everyone in the middle class to be able to have access to justice. So I hope UW will be able to help continue to be to take leadership on that. But coming back to Seattle U, one of the highlights of my chair uh, of this year as chair of the Access to Justice is the ability to be able to uh, meet with the incoming president, Eduardo Penava. The Access to Justice Board with partner with them, um, uh, with help with Dean Annette, we were able to host him. And it was an highlight of this year because he had history of working within the confines of the law to promote access to justice, even as dean, you know, as a former dean. So I want to encourage the, the Board of Governors to invite um, uh, incoming President Eduardo, because Seattle, you, you can go to virtually every um, law of whether it's NJP or CLS, every civil legal aid organization in our state as a Seattle U graduate in it. And that is the, there, is, there is a reason why we, we have that, is because there is a deliberate and intentional policy by this school to craft programs that addresses issues of access to justice. And I want to encourage us to meet with the new president so that they can, so that he can continue to provide that kind of support for our bar association. I think I've said so much. Thank you, President, for recognizing me. Thank you, Governor-elect uh, Adewale. I see uh, Dean Clark's hand up. Yeah, the, the question about what to do um, about the need for lawyers in rural areas has come up a couple times. And I, I can't speak to state funding. That's sort of outside my wheelhouse. but. Um, I do want to mention a, a really innovative collaborative approach that the three law schools are taking. Um, we got together and it was really at the, the suggestion um, and urging of uh, the folks at NJP, um, the Office of Civil Legal Aid, uh, NERP, 
um, because they struggle with getting attorneys to um, go particularly to central Washington and to stay. They oftentimes have positions that they spend months advertising. So they came to the three law schools and asked us about the possibility of some sort of creative startup law school at Heritage University in Toppenish, Washington, in central Washington, um, where the great majority of students are Latinx and Native American. Um, and while we're not in a position um, to start a new law school, that's, that's not what we're about, we, we did uh, collaborate with those folks to apply for a grant through the Law School Admissions Council, um, where we would begin a program, an ongoing summer program at Heritage University um, for students interested in law school. So uh, junior, seniors, sophomores, a two-week program that would come to them um, in Toppenish, where the people speaking would be drawn from our three law schools, drawn from the community, um, and then really to encourage and support to create mentorship in the hopes that um, for the period of time where there isn't access to legal education in central Washington, we can at least provide pathways for those students encouragement and mentorship through um, collaborating with the community. We don't know whether we'll get that grant. We won't know until the end of October. Um, but we have the support of the Minority and Justice Commission, several members of the Washington Supreme Court, um, and we're hopeful. And so the idea there is um, those students, if we can get them to law school, are more likely to come back home and to serve communities in Central and Eastern Washington. So just wanted to let you know about that possibility. And certainly if that grant comes through, we'll be calling on many of you to assist us. And, and we should acknowledge that Dean Annette Clark did the lion's share um, uh, of work on getting that grant done, although we're all participating, including having Seattle U um, uh, coordinate and submit the grant. So we're deeply indebted to her um, for her leadership role in this. Thank you for that. And, and that answers a lot of questions for me too. One of the things, like I said earlier, that we were hearing as we traveled around the state and in Shelton and in South Bend and Coopville and, and then again in Spokane was that uh, it wasn't getting necessarily getting people to these communities. It was retaining them and keeping them in these communities. And repeatedly the thought was um, perhaps if we could get students in high school interested in law from these communities and then uh, have their legal education, then they would come back. And that's kind of the same thought here is that the people from those communities um, would get their education and then come home, um, which may be um, part of the solution. So that's good to hear. And, and thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, Governor Clark. Go ahead, President Majumdar. This is from Governor Clark. I would like to ask the deans what, if any, efforts each law school is doing to try to tackle the ever-increasing costs of law school and student debt that law school graduates are facing, the perennial question. I guess I'll start. You know, one of the reasons I, I work at a public school is because of the impact of public education on my life. But I went to public undergrad and law schools when it was really public. I went to a, a public school in California where the tuition was $600 a semester as an undergrad and $4,500 a year um, as a law student in state. Um, and the inflation we have seen in the cost of law school since the mid 90s um, has outstripped any sort of, you know, um, increase in income and the ability to pay. And law school education now is largely financed um, in, in two ways that are regrettable, one by largely by loans and by a greater number of students actually working um, while they're in, in law school um, because of the huge price tags. And so um, as a public school, I have limited options, right? So I have a portion of my budget that comes from a tuition, a portion that comes from a state supplement. Um, and our are in theory, the way in which we lower the debt ratio is by, um, as a public school, having cheaper tuition. But it's a relative number, right? Yes, we're cheap, much cheaper than schools who are charging 50 and $60,000. But if you had told me in 1995 when I graduated from law school that we'd be sitting you know, in 2021-22 with law school tuition for a public school in state 
near $38,000, I would tell you that is not access um, in the way that we imagined it um, uh, when the great public university was created, meaning that the whole notion um, that the price tag has grown so large, um, I think is completely out of sync with the mission of public education. But the truth is um, those fees reflect two things. One, what it costs to run the school where human capital is our largest expense. Um, and two, that our government has to balance a lot of priorities and needs. And so the money to the university and the law school um, um, is, is, you know, um, is not what it once was, but there are many more competing interests. So all I can do to try to lower the cost of school given these sort of limits um, is to raise private money to offset the costs of tuition through discounting. Um, every, and, and I would say most law students receive some kind um, uh, of scholarship aid, however small, um, but, the, but it's not enough um, to reduce the huge price tag. And I think there are a handful of students who receive our, our largest um, uh, sort of scholarships, which um, do give them the capacity to make choices um, uh, with regard to their futures, not burdened by huge debt. But I, I, I would imagine, I'm speaking just as the public school that, that the private schools have similar challenges in terms of managing the cost, but the only sort of you know, tool I have in my toolkit to offset um, our, our higher tuition and lower government sort of aid is to try to raise money to offset the cost. And you know, it, I, I don't know of anything else we can do, or I, it's all I, I can do right now. Thank you, Governor um, uh, Dean Barnes. You know, it, uh, as, as Governor-elect Ottawale and Governor um, Kervicki could attest, in Spokane, we did have a, a good discussion about just that topic and how come the, the tuition is so high and how come students are burdened by this debt. And then others sharing the perspective that you did just, just now, Dean Barnes, that uh, you know, there were restrictions and limitations on, on what can be done, uh, the cost of, of, um, of education. Governor, uh, Governor, Dean Clark or Dean Rixby, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I just might add, it is uh, certainly on our minds always, and no school raises tuition just to you know, drive up the costs that our students bear. Um, we're extremely cognizant of the impact uh, the debt has on, on our students. And I know that personally um, from my time in law school and, and it was not uh, $4,000 a semester. And so I will say, I think at, at Seattle U and Gonzaga, we probably have more degrees of freedom in terms of the awarding of institutional aid, which we self-fund um, to our students. And it, it is a very complicated, extremely complicated um, sort of approach to pricing but I would just share that the, the sticker price is not what most students pay. And um, so the sticker shock though is real. Um, the debt is real, but it is often much less than what it might look like on paper. Um, we educate our students starting in orientation about the importance of financial responsibility and debt management and do everything we can to educate them while they are with us um, about not taking on more debt that they don't need to take on uh, for, for various different kinds of living expenses and other things. Um, so it is something that we try to walk with them uh, in the journey during law school and even afterwards. Um, but as Dean Barnes mentioned, you know, private uh, philanthropy fundraising geared towards student scholarships is something that's, that we're all uh, you know, very much engaged in. And, uh, but it is, it is difficult, right, to make that ask sometimes to uh, people who paid substantially less for their legal education and want to do something else with their money. Um, but it, it, is, it is an area of focus for sure. Thank you, Dean Rixby. Dean Clark? Um, I think my colleagues have covered it well. I don't have anything to add. Uh, a continual, we are asked every year, we're constantly working on this. It's a subject at every national dean's conference um, because, because we feel the burden that our students bear. Thank you, Dean Clark. There was a question, oops, we have it there. Uh, there was a question in chat. Executive Director Nevitt, can you read the question in chat? Uh, 
Oh, wait, here, I've got it. The uh, question is, it's my understanding that ABA accreditation requires law schools to comply with many provisions, including requirements for staff and professors. Are there any plans you know of to address the ABA's requirements, particularly those that serve to increase costs? I think the short answer is no. Um, and, and it's true, the ABA accrediting process, uh, there are many, many standards that we're subject to. And the most expensive one has to do with the requirement of full-time career faculty, which within a university system means tenure track, tenured faculty. Um, and it's certainly true at Seattle U that the lion's share, the incredible lion's share um, of our budget is uh, compensation particularly for staff, but, but also for, I mean, particularly for faculty, but also for staff. So um, I literally, because of concerns expressed by our students with regard to the cost of legal education, have opened up our budget to them so that they can see um, that the expenses are real. Most of them are fixed um, in terms of compensation, the cost of the building, the overhead. Um, and so I have not heard anything in recent years with regard to significant changes in the ABA standards having to do with particularly the requirements of full-time career faculty. Thank you, Dean Clark. Uh, Dean Rooksby or Dean Barnes, do you have anything to add? I will say the, our, the ABA is our creditor, and I agree with Dean Clark that um, a, a number of the requirements do um, create increased costs. But Almost all of our schools are member schools of the Amer Association of American Law Schools, um, which is sort of a member organization. And um, our WALS, that membership and um, their requirements create another layer um, uh, of expense, and including measuring things that you know may now become obsolete over time, like the number of volumes in your library um, in a world where you know innovation means that um, that's not something you need as, as much of. But my, my, my sense is I'm hoping that the trends toward the future um, will create both greater flexibility and lower costs um, for law schools. Because as Dean Clark says, the, the, we have to find some ways to decrease the cost if we want any greater flexibility on our price point. And right now our margins are razor thin and our costs are mostly fixed. So if given greater flexibility, it would mean that um, not only could we operate more efficiently and then pass that on to students, it might mean that you could end up with, um, you, you know, making some investments and in programs that would, would better serve um, uh, both the profession um, and our students. Thank you, Dean Barnes. Governor Stevens. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so I have a question for the three deans, and we're usually talking when we're talking about demographics about students. Can you tell me the, the, your demographics and what your profile looks like for faculty and staff at your schools? I, I should have the staff numbers, um, Governor Stevens. I actually don't. Um, so uh, that's something I can, I can get to you. Um, our, our faculty is about 40%, um, between 35 and 40% persons of color, um, and 50-50 on uh, female, male faculty. So uh, pretty close to even there. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me either. Um, Male-female ratio on our faculty, we're uh, predominantly female currently. I will tell you, we do not have enough people of color on our faculty, and that is a priority for us as we look to hire. Um, we've had a couple retirements recently, and so we actually are, are seeking to fill up to three uh, faculty positions right now, and um, uh, hiring diverse candidates is certainly a priority. On the staff, we are predominantly female staff um, with very few people of color, and it's also a priority for us there, unsurprisingly. So I, I, I don't have our, our stats for um, uh, racial diversity. Our gender diversity is about 55, 45 male to, to female, but I will uh, echo Dean Ruxby in saying that our race diversity um, is very poor, including we have intersectional problems. Like even though I think we have 
low representation uh, of African-American faculty, all of the African-Americans who are on the faculty are men. Um, and in 2021, 20, 22, they have no female African-American faculty member. Now it's one retired two years ago, but there is a problem that you only had one. Um, and so I have petitioned the university for diversity hiring funds. And last year they responded and gave me um, two slots, one for Indian law, and that search continues because we didn't have a successful hire. The other was for a new criminal justice um, and um, civil uh, liberties clinic. And I am pleased to announce we did fill that position uh, just a few weeks ago with David Owens, who's an African-American from Seattle, um, a graduate of the University of Washington and Stanford Law School, um, who's been working as a clinician at the University of Chicago while doing um, both death penalty and Section 1983 cases. Um, my plan, and I just submitted it, is to go back to the university um, this year and ask for increased diversity hiring initiative funding. Um, and in our diversity strategic plan uh, that we just uh, approved as a faculty, one of the uh, five goals is improved um, uh, faculty and staff diversity with intentionality, including um, a plan for each one of the positions we list um, this year um, in terms of what we intend to, to do to recruit a diverse pool. Um, I, and so I just want to say, you know, it's shocking to me in, in this day and age that we still have um, uh, such a difficult time recruiting and keeping um, faculty of color. I think it, there, it is a two-part problem. I think one, uh, we have not been as uh, intentional as we should be in our recruiting efforts. And two, when we do recruit people, they're actually incredibly talented and very sought after by others, including um, uh, the person who had been most recently hired when I got here was an African-American criminal law professor who my, in my first year, it was his second, went to Washington University in St. Louis because they made him a great offer. And so it's not just about, Annette made the point, diversity, and recruitment will get you people in the door. How you keep people is efforts in inclusion and anti-racism that suggests to them that the institution values them and wants them to succeed. So I, I think what we not only need to um, focus our efforts in the ways we have been on um, diverse recruiting, but we need to work on ourselves to create an environment where um, uh, women and people of color um, feel that their personal success is aligned with our institutional commitment. So I just wanted to also just mention to all of you, I want to thank you for your responses. And I'm thinking of, for example, Dean Clark, we both went to the same school. I was in 76 to 80 and you were later. But, you know, as I reflect on what the school looked like at the time I entered, and I think if all of you reflect on that, I mean, uh, it's important to continue to push, but it's also important to, to, to acknowledge um, the progress that has been made that, you know, if you think about when you were law students <laughs> and what things looked like to now, uh, you know, I, you know, so I didn't want to just uh, hold criticism, but also um, thank you for the continued efforts that you're all making. Thank you, Governor Stevens. One other uh, topic that uh, I am sure many of the governors would be interested in uh, is a year ago, we were just coming out of the bar exam and the diploma privilege that was granted for the summer. Um, that discussion continued on into uh, this year. And uh, although we had remote uh, bar exams, um, both in the, in the spring and in the summer, um, we're about to, go back to in-person bar exams um, coming up and uh, I'd like to get the the dean's thoughts on you know from the students perspectives where are we on the bar exam I know there's a, um, a work group that's with the Supreme Court working on that right now uh, and, and and looking at the structure in total um, but I'd like to get your perspectives as well I, I am hopeful that the task force will um, come up with some creative ideas. I'm not sure that any of us think this bar exam is the gold standard um, for qualifications, competency to practice law. Um, I, I will note that 
Oregon had a task force um, that has worked quickly and has already produced a report and some recommendations. And so um, I'm hoping that our task force will look closely at what Oregon did and is recommending. Um, from the standpoint of the students, I, I think they've all understood that they needed to have a remote bar exam. I think the, the WSBA has done a good job now of accommodating their needs. The, willingness to provide location accommodations for students who don't have quiet space or good internet to take the bar exam is greatly appreciated. Um, and, and I think, you know, the world is shifting. I could imagine the bar exam potentially being online for the future as a, as a possibility. Um, we do need to solve the exam soft issue. There were technical problems again in this administration of the bar exam that were bad enough that the WSBA had to go back and offer some students the opportunity to retake parts of the exam. Um, and you can only imagine what a horrible experience that would be for individuals who are sitting there taking the bar exam to have to deal with anything like that. Um, and so I do think there are some problems that still need to be addressed. Those certainly weren't only in Washington, there were national problems with the online administration of the bar exam, but I think students have adjusted, graduates have adjusted pretty well uh, to taking it online. I do understand that it's likely to go back in person. Thank you, Dean Clark. Uh, we're meeting with the Oregon State Bar in about two hours and we'll be sure to interrogate them again about their report. Uh, but, but, Dean Rooksby or Dean Burns? So I, I know Jacob is co-chairing the, the task force and, and uh, it has representation for all three law schools. My, my, my feelings on this are, I agree with Annette that the bar exam is not the gold standard and that um, what, we are, what we need is um, a pathway to practice that ensures minimum um, uh, or sufficient competency and everything should be open and on the table. And I think what I'm hearing from our students um, is, uh, an appeal to, to at least include among the options, um, a discussion of diploma privilege more broadly, looking at examples of it where it seems to have worked, um, including the state of Wisconsin, which has some similarities in that we have um, a very small number of law schools. Wisconsin has two, one public, one private, um, that's uh, religious, and um, where um, by creating both the requirement for um, structured courses and a minimal GPA um, that they seem to have um, created a system that at least works for them. I'm not supporting anything without seeing the data or having a discussion on what we think will work in Washington, but I agree with the students that everything um, should be on the table. And one of the things I will say, and I, it, it is just true, the bar exams, um, the, and I've heard Justice Montoya Lewis say this, the history of bar exams uh, show that they were introduced to be an impediment uh, for folks of color and uh, other socially um, undesirable or low social value folks to, to not be able to enter the practice. And I think it's important to remember that um, as we remark, uh, as we embark upon looking at um, uh, the sort of next um, phase of, of how we prepare um, uh, students to enter practice. So my sense is I'm looking forward to having the conversations and hope everything will be on the table. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Jacob and the, I think it's Justice Montoya Lewis, the other chair, Jacob, who will be um, uh, spearheading this, will do a great job. Dean Rixby. I think my colleagues uh, sort of portrayed the landscape very well. And I know it's, um, it's a topic that's on many people's minds and it's an important one. Um, I do think that our state has and is a leader in addressing um, these issues. I was just in Utah recently. Um, they have done some innovative things. We've done some innovative things. And so I know that the dialogues will continue. I do want to mention I did have to step down as uh, co-chair of the task force uh, due to some personal issues uh, involving my family. But I know the work is, is continuing in earnest. And I have every faith in Justice Montoya Lewis to lead it to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Uh, I see a comment uh, that I'll have uh, President Majumdar read from Chair of the Practice of Law Board. 
I was assuming he could read it himself. Uh, this is from the chair of the practice of law board, Michael Cherry. Last time I looked at ExamSoft and other software which monitors the user's actions, hooks to the operating systems at such a low level that it can be confused with malware. It is only going to get worse as operating systems work with malware. There are other ways to determine that students are taking the exam without assistance, including looking at the answer for evidence of copying of documents and not writing in the test taker's own voice. Chair, Cherry, are you there? Do you, did you want to talk further about that? He may be oh, I, I didn't mean to take the dean's time. Uh, it's just that this has been a problem. I was one of the students who, when I was writing my bar exam, had an exam soft failure, for which I think I received $90 compensation from exam soft. It's not going to be a solvable problem at the way that they're doing it. But there are ways we could monitor in a better way the output of the exam to, to, to handle this. And again, I don't want to take up the important time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Governor Stevens, followed by Governor McBride. Yeah, and so Mike, this question is actually uh, partly to you, Mr. President, and partly uh, to Executive Director Nevitt or whomever, because one of the things you mentioned regarding the exam is we're going to go back to in person, and my question is really, are we going to go all the way back? And what I think about is, are there benefits? Uh, for example, does does not having that be physically present uh, provide uh, greater opportunities for uh, persons with disabilities, persons living in uh, rural areas or having to, uh, you know, have the cost of having to come to some place and uh, have hotel, et cetera, et cetera. So when we say we're going back, you know, are we going all the way back or are we picking up the benefits of, of when we had to do this um, online or whatever. Executive Director Nevitt. I can respond and also invite Chief Garcia to jump in and add anything that she'd like to. Um, my understanding is that the National Conference of Bar Examiners has not given us the option to do a hybrid. So we either have to choose remote or we have to choose in person. Um, we believe that when it's safe to do so, we are more adept <laughs> at providing an in-person exam. However, we do provide a robust set of accommodations to folks who need them. Um, so I'll leave it there and see if uh, Chief Garcia wants to add anything. Chief Garcia. Yeah, I would just add that at this time, uh, remote um, exam is not an option being provided to us. Uh, so it's strictly in-person. Thank you, Chief Garcia. Governor McBride. Thank you, Mr. President. So I, I, guess, I guess kind of a comment and a question for the deans collectively or individually. Um, you know, there's, there's a part of me that feels like the bar exam's a little bit of a distraction from, from the biggest impediment, which is what we talked about, the cost and length of, of law school, um, which I think holds a lot more people back than, than the exam. But if we are looking at the exam, should the issue of uh, required coursework at the schools be on the table in the sense that uh, graduation from either of your three law schools is going to include uh, a certain number, a greater number of core practices or, or specific issues. Do you have any thoughts on that? And uh, I'm just curious if that's being discussed in the task force. Uh, it was being discussed in the task force because I think for a diploma privilege, for example, to work, legal education has to do different things. And that's certainly how it's, uh, it's the case in Wisconsin. Um, where there would be, you know, more set competencies that are required in the, certainly the upper level curriculum. Um, that has advantages and disadvantages. There's differences of opinion on, on what truly is important to test and to know and to learn in law school. Um, and, it, and it might not be what students want. Um, that, and so lots of different things to consider there. Um, you know, no two paths in law school are usually the same. You know, and, and students learn by trying out different things. Um, if law school started to look more like preparation for the bar, that could have some positives uh, in terms of people being, you know, graduating ready to practice, not having to go through the time and expense of a bar exam, um, could have some disadvantages too. So those are being discussed, I know. Dean Barnes or Dean Clark? 
this isn't directly responsive, but I will note that um, Access Lex has come out with a new product called Helix. that's designed to be what I hope is a much less expensive version of a bar prep course. So they're trying to respond to the high cost of the commercial bar prep courses, which is another barrier. When people graduate from law school, they then have the expense of registering for the bar exam, but also virtually everyone takes one of the for-profit bar prep courses. Um, and so I've got some folks looking at this new product. I don't know yet um, whether we're going to adopt it for our students, but it is an attempt to lower the cost of becoming licensed for students, for graduates. Um, I'll just break in here to say the King County Bar Association is doing a group swearing in ceremony at noon. Um, so I at least am going to need to step away very soon um, to, to head to that. Or I'm sorry, at 11, not at noon. <laughs> Thank you, Dean, Dean Clark. Uh, Dean Barnes, did you have anything to add? Nope. All right. Okay. Uh, I am not seeing any other hands in person and on screen. So uh, maybe we can conclude this and allow Dean Clark to get off to her next appointment. Uh, appreciate you coming virtually and talking to us today and, and sharing with us an update on all the law schools. And as always, we've appreciated the, the presentation and the information. Uh, and uh, again, congratulations, Dean Clark, on your 10 years. And uh, we wish you well in continuing to teach uh, for CLU. And thank you to both uh, Dean Rixby and Dean uh, Barnes as well. Appreciate you uh, coming and, and, and being with us today. Thanks so thank much you, for Debbie. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, it is 1045. Uh, we have about 15 minutes before our next presentation. Um, so maybe we'll take another break um, and come back unless there's something else that we can fit in. We could start a little early. All right, why don't, why don't we uh, take then a five minute break and then uh, we'll come back at uh, 10.50 and get started. Thank you. <laughs>